Welcome to Four Scores. I'm your host, John Burlingame. This podcast series brings together the most accomplished film and television composers working today and reveals the inspirations, emotional journeys, and unique challenges that shape their music. In this episode, I sat down with Emmy-winning composer Jeff Zanelli at his studio in Hans Zimmer's remote control complex in Santa Monica, California. We talked about his rise from summer intern to assistant composer to becoming a lead composer with his own team. Jeff tells us about one of his most recent films, Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, as well as his work on the Pirates of the Caribbean films and The Odd Life of Timothy Green. So Jeff, welcome. Thank you, hello. And tell us about this place <laughs> and how you got here. I understand you're a Southern California native. Yes, I grew up in Orange County, the city's Westminster, which is practically a different country from Los Angeles, <laughs> but that's where I grew up. And I, well, I didn't play an instrument. See, I, I didn't have lessons, I didn't have the background, I almost didn't even know to ask to do it. And then somewhere along the line, I, <laughs> my uh, mother found me at the dinner table with a guitar I found in the attic had a broken string, and it was me, the string, and some crazy glue. <laughs> trying to put the string back on, which is not, by the way, how it works, but I didn't know. And she said, why don't we put some, why don't we take it to the store and have like a, you know, a professional fix it. We picked it up on the first day of my sophomore year of high school, after school. So I know, I remember specifically, which means I was just about to turn 16. And that's when I became a musician. So in other words, you know, compared to every composer I've ever met, I'm the latest bloomer. You know, I know plenty of them who started when they were three, playing right. instruments, playing in orchestras, or being in a choir. Uh, so, but then I gave up all my sports and I gave up homework. <laughs> I gave up doing everything except playing a guitar. I was born to a father who was deaf and a mother who was not a musician, and none of my three brothers or two sisters were musicians either. So I have no idea where it came from. It didn't occur to me. I was playing video games. I was reading comic books. And then somewhere in all that, you sort of realize, well, I realized not everyone can hear because half of my parents can't hear. So it kind of skews my perspective a little bit. It makes me go, well, I can do this special thing that not everyone can do. I can listen. And I'm sure that shaped my whole life. So by the time I was finishing high school, I ended up going to Berkeley College of Music in Boston uh, on a scholarship, knowing already I wanted to go into film because it was sort of, um, you know, I had bands, we played songs, and I think it dawned on me so early in that process that I felt like I'd get awfully bored of that. What was it about film? Well, just that, you know, one day you're doing something sad, the next day you're doing something comedic, and stylistically you're all over the place. That's exciting to me. You might be writing a dark electronic score and then a giant orchestral score, like in fact, those two things that I just did in the last few months. So, is it true that you got an internship with Hans Zimmer at a very young age? Uh, yes. What I did actually is I sent out a resume to every single studio in Los Angeles that had anything to do with film music. See, this is how green I was. I thought it's gonna be so hard to pick which studio I get to work for. <laughs> <laughs> but instead I got one phone call back from um, the receptionist at Hans Zimmer's studio and he was writing The Lion King, which funny enough, he was writing just a few months ago too. <laughs> Right. <laughs> he's, he's been on that movie for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I got that internship. I thought, boy, I better not mess this up because they said, well, you know, come and meet us. We'll see if it'll work. <laughs> but, oh, boy. And I took that internship and I brought him lunch every day. And that was how it started, actually. And then, so I presume that it went beyond just getting him coffee and uh, well, meals. Mostly it was, it really was sort of studio maintenance in exchange for getting to hang around a studio. What I learned to do is, if you go in the room with a, with a cup of coffee, and there happens to be a meeting with, say, Jeffrey Katzenberg and Hans Zimmer, <laughs> if you set the cup of coffee down and then walk really slowly, you're going to hear all sorts of great stuff. You know, you might hear some music, you might hear just a little tidbit of like what the culture actually is in a room like that. How does Jeffrey Katzenberg give a music note? How does Hans 
lobby for or against something in the in the, what he wants to do with the score. And I started to kind of piece it together. Eventually, I was sort of trusted and dependable here at the studio. I guess I just sort of made myself indispensable. So by the time I was finished with college, they couldn't bear to see me work anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and I started working in the studios as an engineer. I was very technical. My um, major at Berkeley was dual. I had a film scoring major and, and also a music production and engineering course. The next big step was when John Powell moved in. He had just gotten the job scoring Face Off. Was there some time when you were uh, basically an assistant and then you mm -hmm. graduated to maybe writing a little music here and there, maybe yeah. orchestrating? How did that all work out? Exactly that way, actually. So as John's assistant for Face Off, there were a couple what we call source cues, you know, a little piece of music coming off of a laptop in the background or something that's not necessarily part of the score, but it needs to get written and put in the movie. So I, I ended up doing a little bit of that on Face Off. And then... Um, I think it would have been Ants, which was maybe one or two movies after Face Off for John, where he g actually gave me a cue that was thematic to the score and said, you know, here's the theme, can you write, you know, a, a version of it that would go in the scene? And that took me weeks to write like a minute of music, you know. <laughs> it was a really good trial by fire. I guess I was John's assistant in just a little more than three years. And over those three years, I would take on more and more writing, or I guess I'd say arranging type roles. I ended up kind of shifting over and becoming an arranger for Hans. And that's just a whole different thing. I mean, John and Hans obviously write radically different from each other, but no different in the sense that the work ethic is, is actually what drives it and, you know. What an education! Oh yeah, <laughs> between these two top uh, composers. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, right. The and then being the in the room while the meetings are going on. I mean, you must yeah. learn a lot from. That was uh, so for me. I have to say that was the that was the education actually. You know, I, I think it sounds silly to say, but writing music is not the hard part. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's interesting. You might talk, talk about that yeah. for a second. Sure. Well, I mean, of, of course it can be, and sometimes it is. But I guess what I mean is. I know that I know how to write music, I already know that. What I don't know when I sit down and meet a director for the first time is how to talk to that person and they don't know how to talk to me yet either. This is why you see so many great director-composer relationships because they work out a way to talk to one another and everything becomes streamlined. I want to talk for a minute about the Pirates franchise, yeah. which although your name is up front on the fifth Pirate movie, yes. In fact, you worked on all of them. I did. But you were involved from the very I first was. picture. Yeah, and I think people know the story on that. There was a very shortened schedule. There was three weeks to write it, and I got the call from Hans on, I think it was a Saturday, and it's, oh, Jeff, can you be here in an hour? <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. At that point, Hans had already written this demo, which is sort of circulated. You may have heard it. It's, I think it's titled by the time he finished writing it. It's called something like 6.44 a.m. Because he wrote it overnight <laughs> one night when, uh, when he got a call from Jerry. Jerry, <laughs> Jerry Bruckheimer, who said, I need some music like now. We need, to, we need to get going on this score. So we watched the movie. You know, the effects weren't in yet, and it was still semi-rough given how close we were to print mastering the movie and um, I don't think anybody knew that it was anything other than you know a really good eccentric movie but I, I do remember this on the first movie writing a cue getting to a certain point and going okay I need the love theme what's the love theme right <laughs> so I pick up the phone it hadn't been written yet and I'm calling hands I'm like uh, I need a love theme I haven't got one I, I gotta do something else Buff. and the phone goes down I'm like all right I'll put in a placeholder we'll move on you know we come back it was absolutely mayhem the writing process on that <laughs> you just like you didn't know what you needed to be doing until you finished a task and then it was like what's next what can I work on what is nobody else looking at because there really were you know 10 of us that had, that had started writing and we took um, that demo that Hans had written and started kind of like pollinating the movie with it. I, even up until the last possible day, cues were being written for the film. But somehow it all got done. It somehow all got done, it always does. And it was and a huge hit. It was a huge hit. 
The second movie was like almost the polar opposite in, in excess. We had sort of, I don't know, 16 weeks and basically anyone who had worked on the first movie was welcome back. And we kept doing them and then, um, and I guess just that probably was what made it easy for me to transition. So how great though that they gave you the fifth picture. Yeah. Um, and I, but with your name up front, mm -hmm. was that at all intimidating or, or was that just like, well, let's do another well, one? It's funny, not really. I mean, it should have been. Um, <laughs> it sort of felt natural, you know. I mean, Jerry Bruckheimer obviously knew me from, we'd done four Pirates movies, we'd done uh, Pearl Harbor, we had done The Lone Ranger all together. The person I didn't know was the director who was new to the franchise, actually new to Disney, um, Joachim Roning, who came over, he and Espen Sandberg, they were a directorial team. And they came over to meet with Hans and I and just sort of talk it through, you know. And Hans said, I'm not going to do it. I think Jeff can do it. And they said, great, <laughs> let's start. So musically, what was required? Well, first off, anything that was going to be using the sort of what I'd call the legacy themes. Well, I've already used those themes. I know how they go. I know how to work with them. And so that was easy. It was like having a safety net in a way. But there were a lot of new characters. There was Karina who needed a, it was also tied into a love theme. So her music was a new thing. And then Salazar, which was our great big new bad guy. And um, played by Javier Bardem. Right. Uh, there was also, you know, a need, I thought, for there to be some more Jack Sparrow music because um, I think we'd kind of come to a place where he, Jack was down on his luck. It was like his, his sort of, he started to sort of lose his Jack a little <laughs> bit. And so it, it was either take the old theme and sort of pervert it in some way, which I didn't think was as strong as maybe getting, you know, we did use some of the old theme, of course, but then um, we had to take him pretty dark. And then he also had some new kind of, um, I guess you'd call it like an adventure motif that I was using in the film, so. You used a lot of electric cello yes. in that score. And, yeah. I, and I'm not sure that people generally even know there is such a thing. No, they might not. I always think of Pirates as this, it's, it's rock and roll on an orchestra. And I think people have sort of talked about that a little bit. Once you kind of get your head around that idea, which is actually inspired by Johnny Depp being Keith Richards in a way, you know what I mean? That's right. where his inspiration came from. Uh, and then you get to the idea that pirates are the original rock stars and there is a certain like swagger about it and, and you can see the connection. That then it becomes sort of fun to go, what can I do to the orchestra to rock it out a little bit? What can I do that's maybe irreverent even though we're using a very sort of proper instrument like a cello, we'll stick it through a guitar amp and you know, it, it starts to get interesting. In fact, the um, theme for Salazar ended up being three different electric cellists all on top of one another. The three of them all together made this just sort of a massive sound. I got excited about it because it somehow didn't work when it was just one player against an entire orchestra. It started to feel like, well, all you can do is turn it up and then that makes the orchestra sound small or something. So I just need more of them. And so we ended up making sort of an electric cello section, I guess you'd say. I think it's so interesting because what you're talking about is some of the innovations mm -hmm. that Hans and his friends have yeah. brought to film scoring. The whole idea of even taking an acoustic cello and plugging it into a guitar amp. Right. It's a kind of leap forward, I think, in thinking about film music. It's, it really is about what are these ideas? And that applies to any movie you work on. You know, if we talk about The Odd Life of Timothy Green, I can tell you what the ideas were, even if it's not an electric cello. It's built around something important and specific to the film. The music that I like in films usually could only ever be written for that film. I don't typically like it when you can yank music out of this World War II movie, put it over that World War II movie and have it work. I think it shouldn't, it was written for that one. Salazar needed something specific. I think Maleficent needed something specific. And you don't hear that music in other movies.
Four Scores is brought to you by the Four Scores Playlist, featuring music and interview clips from each composer featured in the podcast series, including Jeff Zanelli's scores from Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, Pirates of the Caribbean, and The Odd Life of Timothy Green, and so many more. Experience the movie magic you love whenever you want. Do you consider yourself a storyteller? Absolutely. I think you have to be. In fact, I'll tell you this. David Kapp, who is a director I work with often, um, and also a writer, of course, he said to me a lot of very important things in my career, but one of them was, every single person who works on a movie should have assistant storyteller on the bottom of their business card. Every note is in service to the story. That, in fact, actually, I think is what separates a film composer from a composer. You you mentioned uh, the Odd Life of Timothy Green. Yeah. That's another Disney oh, picture so that fun, you've worked yeah. on. And Odd Life of Timothy Green was the first one that I did as a solo credit. I got the script, fell in love with it, and I started writing. And I sent music to Mitchell Lieb, who is the head of music at Disney. Oh, I like it. I wish it were more quirky. And I said, got it. And I wrote him a piece of music which I called Quirkington. <laughs> and I sent him an MP3 and by Monday he says, okay, this is already off to the director. I love this, I think it's great. So, you know, don't get your hopes up, kid. <laughs> and then I kept writing without anyone telling me to. And I started just going, you know, I like this movie. I think I can tell this story. It's a movie about parenting and I just had become a parent. So it sort of felt personal and important and right. And I kept coming around to the word handmade. You know, the word is popping for some reason. It means something, right? And then I started going, so now it means that the music should feel handmade, which means, let's just be literal for a second. I want to feel hands on instruments, right? I want to feel like, because I play guitar, I'm even holding one in my mind. <laughs> and I want to hear the sound of the fingernail and the flesh. And I want, you know, I don't want to just hear the note. So where do I have to put the microphone to get that? And when we'd sit there moving it around centimeter at a time. Oh, there it is. That's the sweet spot for the demos. <laughs> you know, I want to feel the person in it. And then the cello part, that has to be someone where they have a personality. And we even built the orchestra that way eventually down the line where I didn't want a huge group. Um, which is an easy phone call to make to the studio. Yeah, I just want eight players. <laughs> they go, thank you. You know, <laughs> I wanted to hear eight individual players, not what you normally associate with an orchestra, which is say eight celli playing together as one. You know, we were putting the mics a little closer, getting more of them on the individual players, and reminding them. Remember when people used to have to tell you to tuck in because you were playing a certain way. I want you to go back to that way of playing. I want you to play out a little bit, every one of you. And we sort of designed the score around this idea that individuals mattered and each person was different and each sound was different. And it also made the score very colorful because we had all these folk instruments. And I mean, I was hitting the back of my ukulele with pencils. You know, we were doing all this stuff that kind of related to the story and, you know, made it very bespoke. And, and very special, I think. Thank you. And yet, at the same time, maybe potentially risky in the sense that sure. it, the score was a little bit out there. Yeah, I, I think it was a little bit out there. Not risky in the actual content. It's not edgy music by any means. I mean, that was a folk score. It was a very intimate, folky score. You know, again, I guess part of what is the luck of my career is I can go and do something very classical sounding or orchestral sounding like Maleficent is, or something a little quirkier like Odd Life. You know. So let's talk about Maleficent, sure. Mistress of Evil. Yes. Now, you didn't do the first film, so how did this one come to you? Well, it came to me because uh, it's the same director as Pirates 5. It's Joachim Ronin. He talked me through the movie, told me the plot, which was really interesting, exciting. It's an adventure and what he wanted to make, where he wanted to expand the world, I guess you'd say. And I started thinking almost instantly about the Dark Fae, which is a whole new sort of uh, culture in the movie. You, you find out Maleficent is not the only one of her. <laughs> she finds that There are she, lots of winged creatures. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and they're the Dark Fae, and they've actually, really the story behind them is they're multiple sort of nations or tribes or cultures, I guess of dark fey that have now banded together for survival because they're oppressed by the human cultures that are now sort of dominating the world. 
And so they've all kind of banded together in this place. It's sort of like a little sanctuary, I guess. And what does that mean? You know, what does it mean musically? What does it mean to be oppressed? And what does it mean to um, not be human in a world where the humans are now taking over? That really is their story. So it became really a question of what do each of those cultures mean? What do they represent? Are there real life uh, comparisons to be made? You know what I mean? Is it a fantasy element? I mean, this movie has fairies yeah. and, <laughs> and, and these winged creatures that we're talking about, and there's kings and queens yeah. and a royal wedding that may or may Correct. not happen, and yeah. there's a lot of story. There is a lot of story, right. And actually where it expands though, you know, there was always a sense in the first movie to me that the score, brilliantly written by James Newton Howard, was always choosing timeless over trendy. In fact, I even said the phrase, timeless not trendy, to Angelina Jolie, and that was when she went, I feel so good about all of this, right? You know what I mean? Like it was kind of like the design of the movie that sort of all got in sync. And of course, Yoakam wanted the same thing. He wanted, this is a movie that didn't want to lose track of its roots as the original fairy tale from 50 years ago. That's where the orchestral music comes from. But now we've got these creatures that feel as though they need something outside the orchestra to play them. And so it became like, well, what instruments can I deliberately mismatch, actually, to create this sound? And we'll still need the orchestra. It's a great big movie. We can have drums from every country on Earth. We can make instruments. We can bang the walls. We can do whatever we want. So yeah. what did you do yeah. for the sort of the fairies and the sort of magical side? So we had, you know, the Celeste and the two harps and um, the orchestra, and a lot of it is also just the language of the music. You can use certain chords that become sort of ethereal or surreal or... Kind of mystical sometimes. Exactly, yeah. And so they're not just sort of standard. And then, of course, you have like human kingdoms, which have a much more upright, regal sound. And you think of brass or you think of... There are some fanfares. National anthems. Yeah, exactly, fanfares. Right. And, then, yeah. and then, as I recall in the castle, there's some sort of early music sort of sounding Yes, a little material. bit. We, I, yes, I finally got to book a harpsichord player. <laughs> 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 you don't get to do that very often. Yeah. Talk about the use of choir. There's a sure, lot there of choir in the score. And more than, probably more than I even expected when we got sat down and started recording, it was like, wow, there's a voice in a lot of these. When you hear a voice, it does something to you. And in fact, so many instruments, I would argue, were invented to sort of imitate the human voice. The cello sounds to me like a father. It just has the sound of, it almost has lungs. And obviously any woodwind instrument has lungs. <laughs> the human voice, to me, exists in the space between the audience and the screen, and it invites you to lean in a little bit. It doesn't have to be a choir. In this case, it was. The other thing that you can do with a choir, because it's human, is if you make a noise that isn't human by, say, creating a wailing like a banshee, you can create an emotion very quickly and, and very primally in a good, positive way or, or magical and deep, dark, terrifying way, you know. So how big was your orchestra and how big was your choir? Orchestra was 108 people, I believe. The choir was 40. And then there was a children's choir, which was another 16. What would you say was your biggest challenge on Maleficent? It's still the dark fey music, even though that's where I started. They're really talking about an underdog group, you know, that really on paper doesn't stand a chance. Right, it's you the know. last of their kind. Exactly, really. and if it's open warfare, it's all over. So this is a, a very marginalized culture. I think that's probably the modern touch of this movie. That music was difficult. It was difficult to write it, but sometimes that's just what it is to be a composer. Sometimes you really got to push through the wall a little bit. So talk about working with Joachim. Mm -hmm. um, how would you guys collaborate? Would you offer him ideas? Would he then come over and listen? How did it work? Yeah, okay, so he came up making independent movies in Norway. He was an accomplished director, but all of a sudden he was doing a $300 million movie in Pirates. And that allowed him the sort of luxury of hiring the people he wanted to work with and trusting them, and then weighing in on the work, right? Some directors work differently. What Joachim does is he goes, Here's a story, here's, you know, my very rough thoughts, write me some music and then let's talk. And that is really how we handled the whole thing. Other directors will be very specific. 
it should be a horn melody, it should be fast, and it should be a waltz. Okay, fine. You know, that, and you get that, and you can work that way too. So you play him a piece of music, and he will have ideas, but he needs your music first to respond to them. So the score becomes very collaborative, and that would be how we did the whole movie. Uh, every theme, every scene, and then obviously at certain key points in the process, we'd watch as much as we had to look at the full architecture of the movie. Are we overusing a theme, for instance? Are we getting too big here, too small here? Those kinds of things. Have you reached the point now in your career where you need help just as Hans used <laughs> you as an assistant many years ago? Do you sure. have a team now? Yes, I do. And it depends on the movie, too. On Maleficent, there were only two arrangers, par partly a product of the um, schedule. We actually had quite a while to write it. And I actually like that role in some ways. The, the sort of mentoring role sort of feels like a pay it forward type of thing. And I think Hans, more than any other composer ever, I think, has mentored and ushered in many careers. Obviously, I'm the beneficiary of that. We could just do this all day. That's right. <laughs> like I dozens. Think there may be over a dozen oh, uh, I'm sure. major composers yes. now, all yeah, of whom started under Hans's that's tutelage. That's right, yeah. So knowing what you know now, what would you tell your younger self to do differently? <laughs> oh, boy. Remember, the, the value is actually the moment hunched over the piano at three in the morning when no one else is around and you find the first two notes of the next tune. That's incredibly valuable. It's an emotional, just me thinking about it right now. I heard this great thing. You know, go home tonight and write a poem and write it by yourself and don't tell anyone else you're doing it and write it as well as you can. And when you're done, tear it into a thousand pieces and throw it in the trash because you've already gotten full value from the process of writing the poem. Forget for a second that almost every note that I write actually goes out into the world and goes into a movie. What if it didn't? Would I still do it? You have to still know the answer to that is yes if your music is going to continue to have real value. I'm not, you know what I mean? Mm. I don't know that that applies to every note I've ever written. I, I hope it does. As soon as it sort of dawns on you, uh, no, I actually could do this. I could do this and I would do it even if my day job was banking, even if I was an accountant. This is what I would go home and do. This is what I'd want to do. Thank you for spending some time. Yeah, of course, Jeff. of course. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Four Scores. Please subscribe and make sure to share this episode with your music-loving friends. It'd also be great if you can rate it because that really helps others find the series. See you next time. Watch Maleficent, Mistress of Evil and listen to the soundtrack wherever movies and music are enjoyed.